First, let us acknowledge the source of all men. Let us acknowledge this house, the Jubilee Hall, and the land that we're on. Let us acknowledge Mana Whenua, Konaji Fatwa Ki Orake. Let us acknowledge those who have gone before us, and especially the 51 who have martyred for their faith in Christ Church. Let us acknowledge all of us gathered here, in person and online. On behalf of Pax Christi Aotearoa, Ngā Mihi Kia Koto Katoa, and on behalf of us all, a very warm and grateful welcome to you, Kanja. Salam alaikum. Uh, before introducing Anjan, there are some practical notices. Uh, first, I realise I need to apply to myself, and that's just to ask you to put your phones onto silent. Um, if you're looking for toilets, if you go out through the back, the exit for the entrance where you came through and turn right, and there's also a toilet for disabled people almost immediately slightly to the left, just outside the door there. And just in case of an emergency, um, either if you go out through that um, entrance way, you'll see an exit, or there is an exit on the side, and you just ask for a symbol in the um, ground parking area outside there. Now I want to give a little background to David Braken and our memorial lecture. David was the first president of Pax Christi Aotearoa, a section of Pax Christi International, an organisation committed to work for peace and justice. As a young man growing up in a Catholic family in Sydney, David was very interested in interfaith dialogue. His extensive travels in Muslim countries heightened his awareness of and interest in the connections of the three faiths of Abraham, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And later, David helped establish the Council of Christians and Muslims here in Auckland. While he was very supportive of all work for peace and justice, David had a special commitment to Palestinian rights. And this is a course in which he and Andrew met and worked together. Andrew, the Wakem Fano, and asked me to tell you how specially delighted they are that you have agreed to give this year's David Wakem Memorial Lecture. And we do welcome the Wakem family and friends, many of whom I know who are here this evening. Another who sends your best wishes is Rosalind Noonan, our former Human Rights Commissioner. She is working in Turkmenistan at the moment, so she can't be here. <laughs> and also very best wishes from 
Kevin and Barbara McBride, who are the founders of our Pax Christi here in this country. As you know, the title of Andrew's lecture is Promoting Democracy in an Online World. Andrew brings a wealth of international and local knowledge to this subject. She is co-chair of the Christchurch Call Advisory Network and a member of the Independent Advisory Committee of the Global Internet Forum for Countering Terrorism. Besides that, she has spent years speaking out and acting in favour of diversity and inclusion. Angela is the project lead of the Inclusive Aotearoa Collective Tāpōno, and in 2019 was appointed a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit. I spoke with Angela a couple of days ago and realised that she has a tremendous amount to share with us. Let us put our minds into high concentration mode so we can take in all she has to say. Welcome, Angela. Boards on 4chan and 8chan. 
But by his own account, and of course we have to accept that he is an unreliable narrator, but by his own account, YouTube was to him a far more significant source of information and inspiration. More recently, earlier this year, there was an attack in Buffalo um, where a killer entered into a supermarket and targeted black people to shoot them. And I thought I might also describe some of his online presence. Um, our Christchurch terrorist used Facebook to live stream his attacks. The Buffalo attacker used Twitch, which is owned by Amazon, to, to do his live stream. Um, but the live stream was also available on Discord. So Discord is another platform, and he had a channel there with some people that had subscribed to that channel. Um, so the live stream was also available there, it, along with that is being posted as manifesto and part of the diary that he had. Um, and although Twitch was, once the shooting started, Twitch was able to take down that video <laughs> in, two, in about two minutes because of user reporting. Um, because it was also live streamed to the Discord channel, it was from there that the live stream video um, was downloaded to a website. And then instead of sharing the video itself on platforms, the link to that website where the video was, was shared and there was about 600,000 views of that video. And in this case, and again, you know, I'm a reliable narrator, but this video claimed to have been significantly influenced by 4chan. So I read some research about um, and the internet and, and a researcher who looked at 15 cases of terrorism and extremism and how the internet is impacting in the space. First, the internet creates more opportunities to become radicalised. Second, the internet acts as an echo chamber. It's a place where individuals find their ideas supported and echoed by other like-minded individuals. Third, the internet accelerates the process of radicalisation. Fourth, the internet allows radicalisation to occur without physical contact with like-minded terrorists. And fifth, the internet increases opportunities for self-radicalisation. So, the way that mass murders are being live streamed, as you can see, is starting to evolve. So as measures are being taken to remove the ability to upload and, and make these videos go viral, uh, the actors are finding new and different methods and ways to try and circumvent the systems that are put in place. Um, the Christchurch mosque attack was the first major use of a live stream attack that was used in that way. Um, and it went quite viral. Uh, Facebook systems were not up to speed and within 24 hours, I think it was about 1.24 million copies of the video were taken down. Um, and so the killer was able to bypass all of Facebook's check. And, and the slow response was what led to that virality of that live stream. Um, and we know, for example, you know, that was the day that the young people had decided to have a climate march. Um, many of them were locked down in the mayor's office, they were locked down in their schools in Christchurch, and they were watching the live stream. Um, many other young people had watched it subsequently, even though it was reasonably quickly made uh, objectionable material. Um, and at the time, you know, prior to the attacks, and even as early as 2017, um, people were warning about this live stream capability and what it might lead to, and there were examples. Um, and I have a quote from a Guardian article with, um, from 2000, January 2017, where it says, Facebook's own system tower. The site aggressively pushes video to the top of the news feeds while it's still alive in an effort to encourage the inter interactions that I've heard spoke of, allowing videos to snowball rapidly to large audiences. Which is not to say that live stream doesn't have its uses, it does. I mean, it's a good way to document crimes by the state, but it was also able to be exploited. Um, and of course, one of the exploiters, and, and if we recall back to around 2014 15, was when the ISIS beheading videos started coming up, and ISIS was starting to use um, social media platforms to um, propagate those kinds of things as well. So that um, 
was why in 2017 um, some major platforms got together to create the Global Internet Forum to counter terrorism. Really, it was a way for them to cooperate with each other to ensure that these videos um, were not uploaded onto each other's site. And so that one platform got wind of it that the others would get that information very quickly and be able to take, um, take that content down. So they use this thing called hashes, and, um, and they have this hash sharing database. So a hash is like a digital fingerprint. And each iteration of the video um, will have a different hash. So if you took the clip, that would have a different hash. If you took the full video and did a voiceover or added um, captions, each of those would have a different hash. So you understand the scale of the problem because people are taking these videos and modifying them all the time. So to stay on top of, um, of uh, the, the content and, and ensure that it doesn't go up and it doesn't spread, uh, it takes quite a bit of work. Um, in 2019, GIFCT was restructured to be an independent organisation um, and that it, was, it used to sit with Facebook, so they moved it out of Facebook and made it independent. However, the operating board of this organisation is Facebook, Microsoft, Twitter and YouTube and all of the funding comes from the tech platform. So in that sense, um, <coughs> it is, you know, it is not independent and that it is an organisation funded by tech platforms and the governments is also tech platforms. Um, but they decided when they did that restructure to create an independent advisory committee made up of civil society organisations and government representatives. So um, I was fortunate enough to be on, uh, on the advisory committee in this, uh, July when I travelled to San Francisco for um, our annual meeting. I was uh, chosen to be the vice president or vice chair, I should say, the independent advisory committee. So when they set up the system, they had really stringent criteria around what could be taken down. Um, and, and they use this thing called a crisis incident protocol. So the crisis happens when somebody started the live stream, people being killed, and video is playing. They need to get into gear, get those caches in, get that stuff taken down, get the live stream stopped. So like, it very much is a live crisis situation. Mm -hmm. And so they will activate that, but the criteria, and particularly in 2019, was that it had to be perpetrator-produced live stream videos, and that's the only thing that they would allow um, to, to activate the, the protocols. Um, but now they've, they've kind of widened that to include PDF files, manifestos, um, and more recently, because of Buffalo attacks, they now have the capacity to take down those links or URLs um, to the other websites. <laughs> and you might ask, why perpetrator only? What if somebody else was filming it? Why are they taking those down? And I would just say to you the words George Floyd. And you will recall that actual video of a man being suffocated by a police officer, where bystander video. Um, and went viral and the impact of that in terms of social movement, just social justice movements, protests, um, and a push for change that wasn't just in the United States of America but actually went around the globe. Um, so I guess the thing is there's also um, the fact that a lot of these videos and organizations like Syrian Archive and so on um, are trying to protect videos which are incredibly violent, but they are documentary evidence of war crimes. So again, you need to think about when you're taking this stuff down, what purpose might it serve and what might be harmed? Because if all of those videos are removed, then that is documentary evidence that could be used in an international criminal court or a local jurisdiction. So the, the, the parameters really are about does the video glorify violence? Does it justify violence? You know, what is the context of it? And generally, the perpetrator produced videos, they very much are trying to get the world to see what they're doing um, and to, to make it seem like they're doing this great and wonderful thing. Um, but there is also then the question, because the whole area of the Christchurch call and GIFCT is around terrorist and violent extremist content online. 
Um, and so this isn't a hypothetical, but I won't name the attacks, but if you have a live stream attack, as you've had in the last couple of months, we're a person went around shooting people and live streaming it. Um, but it was deemed to not be ideologically motivated. It was deemed not to be terrorist, but more, you know, it might have been a revenge attack or it might have been, you know, like a criminal act rather than a terrorist attack. Um, and so then there's that question, well, should we be taking it down? You know, does it fit the criteria? Should it be taken down? Um, and I think at the moment the feeling is that they will take it down because by the time you sit there and debate whether a thing should be taken down, you've lost all the <coughs> valuable minutes that it takes for something to go up and get, you know, go viral. So that brings to mind the broader question, and this is one of the big questions globally that has been grappled with, is around definitions. What is terrorism? Who gets to define terrorism? What is violent extremism, right? And what perspective are you looking at it from? And how do we ensure that these definitions are used by states to quell dissent? And so you will see, for example, in, in Hong Kong, where um, activists and so on were called terrorists. And in other parts of the world, that, that term is being used by government in a way um, to quell dissent. And so like hate speech, Context matters, right? Understanding the situation and the content. Um, and interestingly, in New Zealand last year uh, passed legislation that broadened the definition of terrorism. And I was one of the people who um, submitted against broadening of that definition, but I went through anyway. Um, and my, it, it went through in the wake of the Limola tax to very little um, public outcry at the time. Uh, although there had been quite a bit of concern prior to that, but after the attacks, that seemed to have died away and they sped up the process a little bit. Um, but, but my issue was that there was no evidence that broadening this definition and giving the state more power would actually make us any safer. And the minister at the time had said that this broadening definition would not have had any impact on the Christchurch um, killings. Because the issue there wasn't the definition of terrorism, the issue was that they didn't know that I was here and they didn't know what we were doing. Well, so that's, that's what the report has said. Um, and the, another problem with the definitions is that there is a very strong focus on organised groups. But what we're seeing now is the way that people are, are conducting these attacks. They're often not part of any organised groups. They may be part of these chat rooms, they're certainly part of groups where they are being, you know, talking about these ideas, um, seeing things that enrage them, not seeing any counter points, counter um, evidence or, or anything. And so it is, it's not like they're, they're, they're alone, they're in a group but it's not an organised group. And it may be that very few people in that group know that a person is going to go out and commit the act. That doesn't mean it isn't a terrorist act. Um, and at the moment, there's a lot of reliance on the um, UN designated sanctions list, which is almost exclusively um, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Taliban. Like there is pretty much hardly any um, Right wing extremist groups on there, white supremacists, neo Nazi, alt right, very, very few. Um, and at the time that the bill was passed last year, they added a few more organisations and we still had no um, organisations that were outside of that, you know, kind of ISIS, Al Qaeda space. Even though the US, Canada, and Australia, and possibly UK, had designated um, a few. Um, groups. So I'll, I'd like to move on to the, the issue of algorithms because it's, it's really important um, in terms of the way that this content is brought to people's attention and the role that algorithms play. So there's various different types of algorithms. So there's recommended algorithms. So when you do your um, internet searches, aka Google it, um, then, then it will recommend entries to you. 
And the algorithm kind of learns from what you click on. Because what they want is for you on your front, your top 10 entries to be the entries that you will click on. They want to increase engagement, and so it feeds off what, what you're clicking on, which means that increasingly over time, you get more polarized um, recommendations coming up because you tailor for what the system is learning that you like. Um, in, in social media, they're using algorithms that are around, you know, if you need, you're on Facebook, um, I try and avoid being on it a lot, so it's the place that I hang out. Um, but, you know, you, you can click like and you can, they give you a lot of options now, with like angry and sad and the heart and so on, you can react to the post. Um, and the uh, whistleblower well, last year, uh, which you may have seen in the news with you, that the angry button is given about five or seven times the weight of a like. So it is actually the system is promoting anger and outrage, it's rewarding it. So if your post is more outrageous, <coughs> it's more inflammatory, it's more divisive, that will really increase this. And it's not just that people naturally respond to the outrage, it's that the system is also designed to amplify it. Um, and so, Understanding what impact algorithms are having on reach and, and how many people see a thing, um, and what impact do users have on algorithms? So, the fact that you, when you start liking things or reacting to things, the algorithm is learning from your interactions online. Um, and if you're watching the news after the Christchurch Call Summit in New York in September, um, you'll see the Prime Minister had announced that they're doing some of this funding now and they're going through the process of doing some research on this stuff. And one of the issues has been a lack of access to data within the companies. So they don't allow independent researchers to go in and get the data that might show what impact those algorithms are having. Um, a, a little bright spot in, in that space was that the European Union passed the Digital Safety Act, which is now requiring <laughs> tech platforms to allow independent researchers to go in and access data um, so that we can improve our understanding. But there's certainly nothing locally, no laws, legislation, regulation that is allowing that. Um, and so generally what we're seeing is there is really a lack of regulation at all around the way that these platforms are designing these systems and the impact that these systems are having. Um, Although there, there is currently a court case underway, so the Rohingya are still in Facebook at the moment um, for their contribution to the genocide um, in Myanmar, which Facebook had already kind of admitted, and, and in fact, they're having a similar impact, Facebook is getting a similar impact in Ethiopia with the Tigray conflict. So, you know, the, these issues are a matter of life and death, they are theoretical. Issues. These are online activities causing offline harm. Um, and aside from death, you know, we know that there are also impacts on mental health, well-being, social division. Um, and then the other type of algorithm is the ones that they use for content moderation. So there are so many posts, you know, you know there's millions of posts going out all the time, and it's not possible for a human being to review the way to make sure that it is not. Um, breaching any standards. So, so they use algorithms for that. And then there's the issue of how many times is the algorithm taking down things that are not supposed to be taken down, things that are maybe jokes, things that are said in anger and frustration, um, effectively tone police in marginalised communities. Um, and on the other hand, how many negatives, how many things that should be taken down um, are being missed. And what, what we do know, and this was uh, last year or the year before us, was that there was that on Facebook only 9% of the content was on the English language. And the moderation for other languages at that point of time was pretty much non existent, which is why you were getting these awful impacts, because there was no um, community standards were not being applied. And, and I don't mean to pick it on Facebook, you know, there are all these other platforms. So that's why um, you know, a lot of the work or, or the advocacy that civil sort of society organisations have been pushing for, and certainly some governments have been as well, is transparency from these companies. 
like reporting on the false positives or the negatives that have been missed, um, reporting on how many requests have been made by government to block or take down accounts, um, and how many times those requests are action. So if you look at the Indian states, um, Twitter has geo-blocked tweets from activists like Sadaa Muhammad and various others, so their tweets cannot be seen in India. They are fact-checkers um, and almost journalists, although in the South Africa is not journalists, but Twitter has acceded to that government request to not allow the tweets to be seen in India. Um, and so, yeah, so we, as a network, we also therefore want to see transparency not just from these platforms, but also from governments. And I think it's actually easier for governments to put pressure on companies because they have the power of regulation than it is for us to put pressure on our governments. Um, so there are other platforms other than the, 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 big, the big platforms. Um, video gaming is, is a space, and, and as you heard, the Christchurch um, terrorist was involved in multiplayer role playing video games from a young age. Um, and what the Royal Commission hasn't covered, and nobody has looked at yet, is who was he interacting with there, and what impact did that have on his thinking? Um, and so um, there is a coronial inquiry at the moment, and we're hoping that the coronal will look into these issues and will require platforms um, to provide some information around that. Let's see. <laughs> um, but also, you know, for example, Roblox is a, is a platform where kids go in and they can create their own video games, and it's hugely popular. Um, and they keep getting to take down video games that are recreating the Christchurch Master Tech from the point of view of killing the Muslims, faction of Muslims. Um, and that keeps happening again and again. Um, of course, if there, as I said, there's the chats on video gaming platforms. Then there are all these platforms that refuse to become members of any organisation like Christchurch Core or the Local Internet Forum um, or any, anything else, um, and refuse to have any kind of community standards or any kind of flatter moderation. So you're looking at things like, as I mentioned, 4chan and 8chan, Telegram. There are websites. I don't know how many of you have heard of Kiwi Farms. Is that familiar? Yeah, so that, that was a pretty awful and hostile website um, that was re recently taken down by Cloudbear, who hosted the website. Um, but the question is, uh, and many people ask this question, is should a private company be the ones that hold the power to remove a website? Should that be a decision that should be in the hands of the private sector? Um, should it be in the hands of government? Then you're getting to stage censorship, censorship. And not all governments are benign, in fact, some governments are pretty awful. So, you know, um, but really, it certainly shouldn't have to be activists putting their personal selves on the line and at personal risk in order to prove how toxic that platform will affect me to that um, public pressure that was found there to take them down. Um, and we know that Telegram has been the platform of choice locally for far right and anti vax groups. Um, and I'm not going to name individuals, you know, some of them, a couple of them are going through court, one of them tried to be on the board of trustees at school, and various other people. Um, but yeah, they're, they're thriving quite heavily and saying all sorts of really, really awful stuff on Telegram with, with no consequence whatsoever. Um, and so, one of the things that is happening on platforms is these deliberate silencing tactics. So it's effectively, um, often it's mass attacks, so like just a whole bunch of accounts just the same on a post. Um, there are plenty of examples of very vile death threats and rape threats, so it's not just as simple as I'm going to find you and kill you with the next Style, but there's some really horrific descriptions of violence that, that people are having to deal with. Um, doxing, which is putting your home address, phone number, and so on, pictures of your house, and I know where you are, I know where you live, come to get you. Um, and 
noticed that blood becoming sexual and coordinated attacks. Um, and, and some of the stuff is state, there's some states and sponsored by states, so certainly India, Russia, and various other states that are investing in this kind of cyber attack because they effectively um, want to silence voices or promote a particular point of view. Um, certainly here, um, we, we've seen that transphobes from, from the UK have defended into New Zealand Twitter account which is overrun posts. And what it does is it makes you just not want to comment because as soon as you say something, you just have all this awfulness. Um, I remember I did an interview on the AIM show and it was about a resource that had been developed by the Islamic Women's Council for schools. And it was a lovely story and a really nice resource and a story that had been developed by uh, a woman who had lost her son from the attacks and she broke him up for her granddaughter. It was called Eye of the Butterfly. Um, so, as usual, they put that video up on their Facebook page and the next morning they email me to say they're taking it down because the comments are so awful. Um, and literally hundreds of comments. Uh, and, and the social media companies are like, you know, are you recording them? It's like, you, you really think I sit here all day and I had time to report 300 comments. And I have tried actually recording 10 of them and not a single one gets taken down. Um, but what it means is that everybody else's video gets to stay up, but mine was taken down, and that lovely story is not there anymore. And that is a lot of freedom of speech. That's a subtle tactic. Um, and the thing is that these, these are very well resourced and coordinated campaigns, and they typically target communities very clever, but they target communities that they know don't have the ability to respond in the same way and to the same volume. Well, yeah because they just, they're all really marginalised. That's who they pick on. Um, and then we move to what we call the lawful but awful content. So it's not against the law, it can't be made of objectionable material. Our back speech laws are atrocious, um, so they provide no protection for religion, <coughs> gender, disability. Um, what, what law we have only covers race, nationality, ethnicity and colour. Um, and even then, you know, it's almost impossible to get them successfully prosecuted under those laws. Um, but, you know, the thing is that we're not talking about active and healthy debate here, right? Often we have bots, so these are automated accounts that provide automated responses. Um, we have paid trolls, so people that are actually paid to disrupt. And um, these, these bots and trolls are testing the boundaries of those community standards all the time and it's very easy, they seem to be able to create new accounts all the time, um, as you saw with the, what is it, Lost Boys, or in Lost Boys Season 2, like they back up again in a minute. Um, and so they quickly learn how close they can go, how to be really awful but not quite over the line. Um, and it's, it's really hard. It's really hard to protect free speech, but also protect from the harm that these things are causing. Um, there's a whole area of research and work on dehumanising speech. Um, and Facebook, and by relation, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn, they all recognise dehumanisation. Um, it's, it's a particularly dangerous form of violence, and I'm quoting here from, from a piece of research. Um, that was done by the Australian Muslim Advocacy Network. Um, it's dangerous because it removes moral objections one may have to enact violence, even mass violence, against women, children, and civilians more broadly within a target group. And explicit dehumanisation is, you know, classically terms such as comparing a human group or humans to animals, bacteria, cockroaches, to filth, disease, weeds subhuman beings, inanimate or long-lived, non-living objects or supernatural creatures. Um, and you'll very often use, see the word it used as a way to dehumanise that this, this person isn't even considered human enough, they're just an object. And therefore it, it, it is much easier when you treat someone like that in your mind to harm them. Um, let's see how we <laughs> um, I wanted to 
move to the area of media and journalists, and particularly women journalists and women of colour, and there's plenty of research out there that shows that women are being targeted much more than their people a male counterpart and people of colour are being targeted much more than their white counterparts. Um, and what we see in these extremist spaces is a real deliberate discrediting of media and media organisations. Um, and I'm, you know, when we, and as part of the work that we do as an inclusive artist or collective, we have engaged with various different communities around their experience of representation in the media. And it's interesting that those conversations, even though we start with questions of what have you seen that is positive in the media, the bulk of the conversation is how badly they feel misrepresented um, and, and the way that they talked about it. And so I'm certainly not going to say that there are issues, there are significant issues with media. But the question is how are we supporting them to be better? and where people are bestowing their clips or their attention, and what media do you actually pay for? Because there has been um, some absolutely stellar journalism, and I think of the Fire and Fury documentary that came out recently, um, the Mataliki coverage, we had three channels showing the same material, which was really, um, I thought it was really great, the Mentu and Zika reporting, um, and, and so much more, there's been some really good and deep journalism. But the question is how do we make that profitable and how do we make it free? Because what we've done finding now is that quality journalism, and this is something that young people have said to us, that the quality stuff is behind a paywall and all the nonsense is absolutely free and very, very easy to access. Um, and so while these groups are discrediting mainstream media. You see the alternative media coming out, such as Counterspin, like all of these kinds of um, these kinds of media. Um, yeah. So certainly, in terms of protecting democracy, that that media space is a critical one for us to pay, put our attention towards. Um, then there's the question of regulation. Um, so we don't get anything by way of product liability, so we don't make any platforms liable for the harms that they cause. And again, I think the Digital Safety Act is starting to, in that direction in, in, in the European Union, but certainly there's nothing here. So we can show that the way that they design the system or what they're doing is causing harm, they cannot be found legally responsible and have to pay up for it. Um, they are mentioned the hate speech legislation, which has kind of died slowly, but it's not going anywhere. Um, but here's the thing with regulation. In a society where there is significant racism and discrimination and significant inequalities, what you find is the regulation is used against the very people that it was supposed to protect. And in fact, it was majority communities who are better able to use uh, legislation to suppress and continue to suppress marginalised voices. Um, and again, around regulation and legislation, when you think about the Buffalo attack, and certainly even with the Christchurch attacks, even those people that were the, the enablers, the people that were in that chat room that took that video, put it on the website, make sure that it's free. I, I mean, I don't know how effective we are at actually holding those people to account for what they're doing in that space. Then there's the whole space of mis and disinformation, um, and there is some overlap there to terrorism and violent extremism, especially when we're using mis and disinformation to radicalise people. Um, so we've heard from various mass murderers as to how they were influenced. And I, the way that I see this happening, there's some really great um, reporting out there, people like, you know, Mark Dowder, Peter and Dave Ferry have done some wonderful stuff on conspiracy theory. Um, and as I read that stuff, what occurs to me is that these people were 
but a very similar way to cults and also to the same, uh, the same dynamic as family violence, right? Because abusers always, what they do first is they build trust. Oh, they're always so charming, they're sweet, they're lovely, they're all full of all goodness, you know? Um, and in the disinformation space, they provide stuff that is absolutely verified and true. That's who they start. Right? And so once you've built that trust, the human psyche is like, okay, so they were right about that, and they start introducing little bits of things that are not quite so accurate, not quite so verifiable. They're right about that, so they must be right about this. Um, and so then what they also do very effectively is to try and isolate you from the people that you care about. And uh, this is very much a phenomenon that you find these people come in. They're drawn and they want to be the single source of information and the single source that you can trust. Everything else, any other media, any other person, any other government that cannot be trusted, government can't be trusted, nothing can be trusted with them. Um, and so you see that's exactly how family violence is. Is isolating the victim from friends and family, people from ours, gaslighting them, making them um, lose trust in their own judgment. And it works like many cons do. I mean, you have all these sophisticated cons, they really rely on people's sense of selves. So, for, you know, in order for you to accept that you have been duped all this time, there's such you know, it's so damaging to the ego. And so even when you're in a con and you've got warning bells ringing, for you to accept those warning bells is to accept that you've been stupid, you've been taken and you're not as smart as you thought you were. And again, this real psychological um, barrier to admitting that you got it wrong and that you got taken in. And they really rely on that. Um, because, yeah, it is it's a fundamental attack on your own identity and sense of self. So I think we really need to learn from these areas of work to learn how to bring people back from the extreme violent positions and from really hardcore beliefs. And it is a really slow and intensive process. Um, so the reason that I wanted to talk about all of these things it's because it is so critical that we start addressing these issues. And it's so hard to address them when so much of these issues are drowned out by free speech arguments that don't actually care about or protect the free speech rights of marginalised people. They very much are about, and there is research that shows that free speech arguments are most often, not all the time by any means, but more often used to protect racist speech. And they are not used to protect those people who have been deliberately silenced. Um, and, you know, I, I get sympathy for the people that say we've got to shoot sunlight on it so it can be refuted, but it's never those people that are doing the refuting, right? So you're enabling all this awfulness, but they need standing up to be counted to capture it. Um, and so we have rights. To life, the right to safety, the right to freedom from discrimination, the right to freedom of association, the right to practice a religion or to not practice any religion. Um, all of these rights are equally important and they need to be balanced. So, for me, an answer is that they need to be statutorily implemented bodies like the Pace Patients Office, which is not allowed to um, be influenced politically or in any way at all. Um, they need to be diverse. So that you have the people who understand what the threat is. Because the words themselves are not the threat, it is the context in which they sit. And a very simple example is um, my mum, she fell over recently and she, you know, she didn't break anything, but she was walking around quite a bit and sore and so on. So a gentleman knew that and she said to me, Oh, I hope your mum's okay. That would be really sweet and lovely, right? You would really appreciate that someone showed concern about you like mum. Now, if it was a mafia person saying, oh, I hope your mum's okay, it's the same words. That isn't the words that make a threat. It's the context. And until people can understand the context, 
you can't deal with the threat. And again, you can learn from family violence because abuse is very, very good at making threats that you can't, it's almost impossible for the victim to explain an action. So what I'm saying in conclusion is that our democracy is fragile. And if nothing else, you know, this is what January um, attacks in the US show just how fine and free their democracy had on on that day and depended on the vice president who didn't back down from what have we had. Um, here we've had parliamentary process protests. We've got significant amounts of lots and disinformation that was and continues to be right and spreading. We've been finding people that have gone down that rabbit hole faster and faster than ever. Um, and content moderation and removal alone will not solve these problems. Just taking it alone is my fault. Yeah, yeah, right. Just taking stuff down is not the solution. There is definitely stuff that needs to be taken down, but that's not going to fix these problems. These problems need to be solved in communities. They need patience, other heart, understanding, and commitment. Which is hard because we also need to worry about food, housing, health, um, climate change, and so many other things. But the fact is that if our democracy fails, if all of those other things fail as well. And for those of us who are more vulnerable, this is a matter of life and death. Who most stands to lose their freedom when democracy fails? Who will be on the front lines to be exterminated? Think about it. Because that may not be like you, but someone like me, it is a reality. So you know the answer. Please don't be complacent. Thank you.
Um, so I, I have missed the bit minute, so I'm going to go through all the videos. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, is, is it live? Actually? It is live now. It's yeah. actually been recorded now live. Oh, okay. That's so you hear that as well. Yeah, and and once, once, once we're finished, we're into streaming. Yes. Then uh, you go to the same link and you can watch yeah, the Yeah, sure. But I'll probably go to it later on this evening. Yes, I watch right. something. Absolutely. Let's do this. <laughs>
as recently as earlier this year, a woman was virtually molested. And whilst it may not have happened in the physical sense, the emotional sense is still there. And immersive technology is what I fear is going to impact us and our kids more than us in one generation, but more so the next generation. Is immersive technology is going to be propagated much more. I don't see as much control or regulation around that. So, first of all, thank you. Thanks. Um, so, I'll try and get you the quote. Um, yeah, I think it will lose hope because the problems feel so big and so large. And I actually was talking to a researcher just earlier this week. And I said to him, every time that I feel like it's all really hopeless, I remember the people that put their bodies online and tried to report in Christchurch. And people that put their bodies on the line to counter protest um, because they care enough. You know, so those people are still out there. And my my view is that, you know, as a fellow person of faith, it's not our job to make the end result happen, it's our job to struggle and to make the effort. Um, and so that, that's the best that I can do. It's just, Try and be in the room and try and be as loud as I can and try and spread these issues as far as I can, try and make people aware, try and motivate them. Um, I guess one of the things after the Christchurch lost attack was that I really lost faith in government and I still don't really have a lot of faith in government. What I have faith in is communities and I have faith in people. Um, and so that's where I put both my input in terms of how do I reach people and reach communities because I think that until we all, you know, make a noise about this, there is, you know, it won't be changed. But, you know, there are positive signs, there are, you know, pushbacks. Um, when you look at election results, Australia, Canada, some of, some of the countries have managed to withstand some really, um, think about the Ontario truck stuff and so on, you didn't see how they would come back from that and yet they had. So um, it's, a, it's a thing about not giving up. And it's the same as the people, you know, that go down the street and hold up and giving up. And what, what is most successful that you see um, is when you keep engaging, when you keep telling them that you care for them and so on. Um, and that is for the cost because sometimes they say some really awful stuff, so it's self-care as well. But um, uh, 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 what will solve this stuff is the connections that we make with each other and when we work together on these issues. Mm. Which is why, you know, if Jeffrey asks me to jump, I say, how far? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes, the second question about immersive technology. I mean, so much of that is around education. It's not just the young people, you know, it's everyone. I mean, What's that? It's one of the worst places in the world for those that are encrypted apps. And, and people who are well educated, people who have PhDs and so on, and they will share a post that says, I wonder if this is true, and a whole lot of absolute, excuse my language, bullshit. And I'm mm -hmm. like, you have a PhD, you understand peer reviewed sites. Where is the reference? Where's the link? There's not a link, there's not a name that you can see the credentials of the person who has um, created this, right? And they're just sharing it. Right? You're sharing it, well, hope to the rest of us have. So really, it's one of the things I spend a lot of time after looking at on WhatsApp and quite the different things sometimes, but just making people aware. But it doesn't have someone's name on it, but it doesn't link to a verifiable resource. Um, or you click on the link and it says the Swiss Medical Research Center and then you Google the Swiss Medical Research Center and you find some of those fact checking sites that show that actually it's a very, very unreliable source. And it's not even a center, it's not even anything. So teaching our kids and our older generations everywhere to be literate about the source of information, where it's coming from, who's saying that, mm -hmm. and whether it's really true. For me, that is a critical piece. Thanks very much. And thanks for the wonderful talk, and I hope you all learned from me a lot. I'm just interested in the point you made about regulation. In other words, who's going to do the regulation? 
But I also get, and I think about hate speech, I get that confused because I think, well, probably it will be government who's deciding who's wrong and who's right, and you, I think you were pretending, um, that may be a government that doesn't like people who dissent, which is <laughs> yeah, so we actually have stuff already, right? Um, yeah, and but when you make that comment, you know, uh, a couple of years back, it was the Films, Videos, and Publications Classification Act that was under review, and I wanted to put in an internet upload filter that could stop stuff being uploaded, and we all vociferously objected to that, and had absolutely no detail of how that would work, who would regulate it, how it would run, it was just a broad provision that there would be one that the Secretary of Internal Affairs would set it up, um, which was just not good enough. Um, and I, at the time I was like, you need to use the front test for any regulation. Well, what if the person who is in power is Trump and is in charge of those institutions, of those regulations, how are we going to be protected? Where are the checks and balances in that regulation? Um, so what we did have, we had the films, videos, and publications, classifications of the Act and the New Zealand Classifications Office, which is a statutory independent body. We had the broadcast and standards act and broadcast and standards authority. Um, there is a currently media regulation review, we're still waiting for a this report now that they review to to detect their comments on that. Um, our laws and regulations are very well out of date. Um, so while media companies have a whole set of standards they are legally obliged to follow, um, social media platforms and all the rest of us have no standards. And all we have is whether it's objectionable or it's not objectionable. Um, and for someone to be objectionable, which means it carries up to 14 years in jail, you get that really high threshold, you don't know anything objectionable. So what about with that online content? Where does that fit? And so that's where I said we get statutory independence, full transparency, every decision is published, like we do with broadcast and standards, um, and the right to appeal, and then the right to go through the courts. Um, all, of, all of the checks and balances that you can put in, right? Because that's the only way it could work, and you get diverse people with diverse cultural and other understanding, uh, understanding rainbow communities, disability, all of those things, um, and gun quality, all of the things. You need that broad range of views in the room to understand when something really is dangerous or whether it's just someone that they're not staying. I don't think I'm really frightened with almost all of you before, but I think I'll just wait and give you the um, microphone. <laughs> Your voice doesn't carry as well as you might. As I say, Hunter, I'm sorry to come in so late, but I just hear your comments. Um, I only came in the last few minutes about government and about our government. And I'd just like to say that um, please have a little faith in governmentation overall or what you said in the New Zealand government. Because when it's the National Party that's in power or the Labour Party that's in power, and that's when we have the Labour Party in power, as I've heard, which is also the fact that we wore all the rest of the humanitarian and all the rest of the finish line to the National Party, as I see it. Um, because I think the National Party is so simple minded and so money minded that the sector of the not um, not favour or help the poorest people in the sector. And what I'd like to just say was um, our government, with it, which is label national is a great deal more sympathetic to what happened and helpful to what happened. And I'm really sorry about that. It was a matter um, about that because so many, so, some other government would do just the opposite. Is it, you know, um, sorry, do you mind? I, but this is a question time. Do you mind putting your question to us? Oh, sorry. sorry. Um, okay. uh, yeah, I was being concise too, please. I, okay, sorry. I've got to say a few words. Um, our government, compared with lots of other governments around the world, present and past, what do you think of it? Um, yeah, I get what you're saying. Certainly, there are risk regimes in the world, but you know, we always get that when we argue for women's rights and say, "Well, you're so lucky you don't live in Iraq or Iran, or you're lucky, you know, women in New Zealand have it so easy." Does that mean that we should stop fighting for women's rights now? Because of the inequity report went in, was it today or yesterday? Uh, we were still casting a 
Um, and then put out the stats, and for the last 10 years they haven't changed because of the <coughs> they, they're not good. So um, I don't think it's good enough to say we're not as bad as someone else. I really don't. Um, and yes, you know, we could have a worse government, absolutely. But we're also are in a situation where um, the Ministry of Justice is doing a national action plan against racism, and that's supposed to report next year. That's now been put up to 2024. Um, we had a social cohesion framework that's supposed to launch, it's still not launched, and one, it's only once it's launched that they're going to implement it. And so, you know, they're like, there's been some really good pieces of work, but I see how slow it is, how difficult it is, and how much of a whim of ministers um, where all this piece of work are just. You know, and I've talked to you know, two twenty women around the country and talked to eight hundred and sixty people in the conversation. Um, and they were talking to us about you know, you seen the report in nineteen ninety, whatever, it's excellent. I went through all the things. Um and it's on a shelf somewhere. Nothing nothing is actually nothing happened. And so um what what I said was I mean I still engage with government a lot. I'm gonna spend my whole Saturday from nine eight to four. I'm not getting a weekend this weekend because, you know, Sunday I'm flying to Ireland, it's my piece of work. Um, so I still spend time with government, I just don't believe that that's where the answers will come from. I believe the answers will come from people in the communities. Could I, could I first uh, draw your attention to what's happening right in this very moment? We're all in a situation right now where we are under the most intense pressure to vilify our people about whom we know very little, to uh, damn them uh, to the end of the earth. We live in a time that is probably the most dangerous I've ever experienced in my lifetime. And of course, I'm talking about the vilification of the Russians at the spirit of that right across our land, and I dare say in this room, people believe them to be what the media tells us they are. Evil. Mm -hmm. And I think, no, no I don't believe it either. But I'll tell you that. I'll just kind of go to the edge of there. And my, my point is, it's the media that is the problem, and I think you can see that earlier. And in that context, I actually include Google as the media as well, and all their uh, offshoots. And that's our problem. Well, we are in a situation where we are having our consent manufactured to take part in something that leads to Armageddon um, and doing nothing about it. I think it's a disgrace. And I blame the media for that. What's your question? That's what I'm asking you to say that you're right. Wrong to me that you don't need the kind of priest and it's the whatever. 
go for it. I'm, I'm not wearing it to please you, so I really don't care. And if I feel like it, I'm not trying to persuade you as to why I wear it, why it's important to you, but mostly I don't care enough to persuade you. But those are all matters of disagreement that we should get, be able to disagree with each other. I mean, for me, inclusion and living together is not that we all think the same way. It's the fact that we can live with each other and care about each other and value each other while definitely having um, opposing views. And it's how we get to believe what we believe. That's the problem. And can I just insert yes. a personal <laughs> a reference here? For some of you who don't know Malcolm, who just asked that question, <laughs> he's Mark Lemons, a really great friend of mine and our family. He lost his job making commentary as a cartoonist on the New Zealand Herald because he named apartheid Israel. He lost his job. So when he's talking about the media is responsible, he's got a personal loss and I have to um, stand up for his position and I Sorry, Malcolm, if I publicly exposed you, but I think it's important that people acknowledge the tremendous price that you pay for your life and your life and your education. And besides, you did a wonderful how to say. Is there any other question? Uh, can I just say, I do think that this is quite important, and I need to respect, there has been a good discussion. Uh, to bring it to the topic, which is about uh, the things that you've raised, actually, yes. So. My question is somewhat naive and how I can this You were talking about how when this information is distributed, what do you think um, First of all, it might start with something that's true. And so people's trust is gained. And then from there on, you might get something twisted, twisted, and so on and so forth. My question, as I said, this is quite a and quite simplistic, is what is the motivation for disseminating this misinformation? Money. It makes a whole lot of money. There, I think there are reports that there are how much money the Islamophobia industry makes. I'm giving you any idea how much that alternative medicine makes, the YouTube monetization. Do you know how much Alice Jones makes on his umbrellas and stuff? I mean, he's got the merchandise, I mean, he's just been slapped with a 1.3 or 1.4 billion dollar fine, and he is today selling his legs and selling stuff. Um, these people are making a lot of money out of it. You go to Gab and these various other sites, and, and as they talk and say all the nonsense, they're, they're saying, if you, you know, if you want to support us, give us your money so that we can speak the truth. They're the only ones that are challenging all these um, fake scientists that have been taken by the system. No, and, and it's like, if they are asking for money, that's one of the signs. <laughs> it's one of the signs that you need to think about, you know. Well, yeah, and how they're asking for your money and for, and for what. So, so all of it that makes a lot of money. All the, you know, you've done an anonymous YouTube channel, our Christ Church channel, so they have to watch to see the anonymous YouTube channel. They get money. They come here and they sell out halls and they sell them out at $100, $150 a ticket with no real cost except for hire and travel, and they bring it, they make money. That's what it is. If people have, and the second reason is political influence. They want to get power. That's, that's what always comes down to money and politics. It's all about the work that you're doing to. Uh, Try and stop the, dis the spread of disinformation. Does your any of the organisations that you work with work in the other end, which is encouraging schools to teach critical thinking, to teach analysis of information, and that kind of thing? Yeah, we do. 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 Yeah, we do
you know, this year is, you know, it's not the space that I'm sitting in, and so for our organisation, I basically stage my team if it's something the government's doing and already looking at, then we're not going to be in that space, which is my point. So our government's already working on teaching history in schools and teaching all the schools and, and some of this other stuff, then, then we don't need to be doing that as well. We need to focus on what's not being done and where we get that. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, I believe there is. I would recommend you go and talk to the Ministry of Education or you know, as many of you as you like, put your views forward and say this is what we want our kids to know, we want them to be resilient, I think they are that way. Um, and then there are people in communities, and I can't say enough about the So You Need So Simple program, which is, you know, who train activists to be on social media to speak back. Um, and they give them the tools to be able to speak back to some of this hate and to try and change the nature of the conversation and, and bring people back from, from like really horrible stuff. Um, so there are there are people that are working on it. We just need more of more of us, way more. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm really worried about trolls. They affect governments, they influence voting, they influence all sorts of decision making. So, what can we do about it? Yeah, that, that is a, a really yeah. difficult question. I wish the answer was simple because I don't know if that had done it already. Um, I guess some of the things is requiring platforms to, to be more aware and mindful of fake accounts. Um, there's this, you know, there are notions of, oh, well, we should make people provide um, verification or the need of, you know, evidence of who they are before they get a social media account that, of course, is highly dangerous. Um, and then, you know, again, we're pointing New Zealand is not as bad as other countries and some countries that's different. Um, so, so, there's a place for anonymity, for pseudonymity, for people who use the same pseudonym um, that they write under or, or they are uh, in social media under. Um, <coughs> yeah, it, it is a matter of. It, it's really hard to spot them, and it's really a matter of working with the platforms for them to figure out, you know, and they're never going to get 100%. The problem that we have. Is that the more trolls you have, the more obligation you have, the more money you earn. Right? The incentive is there to have more trolls and not less. So, how do you change that incentive? And to me, I, I can't think that it's really hard to do it without regulation. One of the companies when I was in San Francisco that we talked to was Wikimedia. Now, they operate as a trust, so they're a not for profit. Um, at the time that we talked to them in July, they weren't available in Turkey because they refused to succumb to the pressure from the Turkish government. Now, I don't know what level of impact that has on their finances, but imagine if, if some of the bigger media companies stood up to countries like India, for example, and refused to turn off or refused to do off and be banned from India. And India is big enough that they're just trying to take their own platforms and not meet these people. So, the, the profit motive. Is, is what keeps them away because the stuff drives engagement. Do you get the question? Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah. As long as there's a question. <laughs> 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 Hi, and um, um, you mentioned that government has been very slow in policy and action. Um, could you um, tell us why you think it's slow um, and why why is this government can be slow, any government can be slow or can be fast, can be good or can be bad? Um, so it's in the design of the system a lot of the time, so then it's in the boost of the system. There was really good review by the Deputy State Services Commissioner, which was then in July 2019, look it up online. Um, that was a precursor to the public service legislation bill that we also submitted to, I think, in 2020 or sometime in 2020. Um, so that legislation went through, and she talked about um, 
the failings of the public service of how the public servants are more loyal to their departments than they were to the actual public or to public service as a whole, with, and various other procedures and the silos. Um, the Productivity Commission, I was just reading a report from them today, um, excellent, it just lays down all of the issues, and I don't know. I think it's, it is, it's actually open to submissions at the moment, that report is excellent in terms of laying down the issues. So, um, some of it is also the fact that we now have a public service where you're not allowed to fail, that being failed by a public servant is front page news and the reason for a downfall of the minister, so therefore it's very conservative and very um, unwilling to take the risk because it's very short term because we have to change government every three years of being long term policies and practices and it's, it's really difficult. But we as an organisation, we don't take government funding. I just don't, this is like one in terms of being able to be free to criticize government and then also not having my project be dependent on what if government is in power and suddenly it changes and all the funding's dried up and it's gone. Um, and I don't want to take that risk. So, yeah, like, I'm not saying that governments can't do anything, I mean, they've got a lot to do, they text us, they do the fight programs and so on, but politically where I sit now, Really, I feel like I want um, green party levels of taxation and eight party levels of government to just get the money into community and tell our people and such these problems. They, uh, you know, they know what the issues are, they know what they need, they know what the solutions are. We just need to find ways that enable, enable that to happen. Mm -hmm. And to educate people and uplift them, and, you know, make sure that they're in a space where they can make those things happen. It's mm -hmm. how and we don't get to help some of those things. Um, we're getting close to 8.30, we said this would run through to 8.30, so um, Janet is going to thank Angel, but I just want to make a couple of thank yous, thank you to each of you that are coming, and if any of you have got contact with media companies, I sent out notes to any number of them, um, telling them about this lecture, and I just think that we need a lot of attention to what Angel is raising with us. So if any of you have got any influence to have um, what you've got to say and your way of presenting it, because I think you've really, really engaged us. Um, so I'm starting to thank you. But I did want to thank Billy particularly, because Billy is celebrating his birthday and he's given up his time. <laughs> of 
um, understanding the chaos <laughs> with his faith and his devotion, and his outreach to the Muslim community, of which you are a very outstanding member. Yeah. And I am sure I'm sharing other people's um, amazement and, and your information. I mean, I expected here to be challenged and inspired, but I'm also incredibly informed by how much you know, and not only in this world of your faith and your accountancy as a profession, but in this extraordinarily deep and wide understanding of the media and um, government policy. So I really applaud you for all of that, and I think deserves another round of applause. Being aware of the way in which um, the, the Islamic world was being trashed and by the media, as Mark himself um, has pointed out, that we have this responsibility to keep the media, especially the mainstream, on two tasks all the time about that. And your prescience is really very notable. And I've got this um, quote from James Baldwin who said, not everything that is space can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is space. And I think that's the message that we've all got very strongly from you, and it's been a personal cost to your own self, your family, and others around you, but it's a very wonderful example to us all to stand up, to be counted, and to keep trying, and don't be dissuaded by people who say it's too hard. So look, um, on behalf of Bax Pussy, um, thanks to everybody who's come tonight, to people who are online, and to everybody who's uh, helped to get together here tonight and arrange this in the honour of David. He would be chuck. Yes. <laughs> um, I'd like you to show your appreciation, and then I'd like to all stand and sing to Tiramai na iwi, because it's a wonderful uh, <laughs> opportunity to gather together. So please, I'm not a singer, but at least I can sing to you ready? <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.